All right, everyone. Hey, um, so thanks for joining. Um, so I'm I'm super happy to introduce our upcoming speaker in just one second here. But um, if you're new to Skag, welcome. If you've been with us for a while, um, this is a, uh, a the third in a series of of discussions that we've had around programmability, automation, and so forth. We started with a discussion last year around you know the DevNet and the DevNet certification, and then not too long ago we had someone from DevNet on and talked about her journey to becoming um, a DevNet advocate, right? And today um, we have uh, Russell Johnson. So um, I'll, I'll give him a quick introduction and let him do the rest. So Russell is a uh, technical solutions architect on my team. And my team specifically covers anything uh, cloud networking or data center networking, right? Which is what the traditional term is. Um, and uh, Russell's gonna talk Really about his journey, right? So we've learned about DevNet. We've learned about um, you know some um, some uh, certifications with DevNet. So Russell's going to take some of that and put it to practical use and examples for us tonight. Um, so hopefully I did you justice, Russell. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, and I'll stop talking. That's good. Uh, yeah. So uh, I am on Robert's team, um, and I am looking forward to this. So I'll get this share going. I have some slides, so sorry. Um, like you said, I'm really going to talk about my journey. So it's a little bit about me. So this is a very different topic for me, way to talk about stuff. Uh, I was telling them earlier today, normally I don't talk a little bit too much about myself and more about stuff we work on. Um, so bear with me um, uh, and a little bit about me. So I am unlucky, like the rest of you down in SoCal. Uh, I am actually located up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So it is not snowing right now, um, and it did rain yesterday on top of snow, so we literally have a skating rink in my front yard. <laughs> but I've been a network consultant for 15 years. Uh, I came out of school, worked in the oil field doing networking. Um, if it plugs into something out there, I I've probably at least tried at least touch of most of it. Um, and then uh, for that large part, I was at a Cisco Partners um, doing, you know, regular route switch. I did some voice, I did data centers, uh, wireless security, the whole gamut. Um, and then about two and a half years ago, going on almost three soon, I, I joined Cisco. Uh, it was a big life uh, thing that I wanted to get here. Uh, and it was a big day. <laughs> um, and one of the things that made me come to Cisco is really what happened with the DevNet model that was about like I'd say it's like eight ish years ago it might be a little bit less than that um, was around the whole programmability and, and then how that evolved into infrastructure as code so when the DevNet associate exam came out I did it first day 8 a.m first 500 in the world uh, super happy uh, and considering that I'm not a programmer at all <clears throat> On the personal side, uh, so I am a big hockey fan, so there's a hockey game on tonight that I'm missing, uh, so I'm going to hold it against Robert a bit. <laughs> um, but uh, usually that's what I'm doing or out playing hockey, uh, and I'm also a part-time farmer, according to my wife, so we do have horses and all that fun stuff. So uh, when I'm not playing around with programmability or just doing my regular day job of playing around with the cool tech we get, uh, I'm usually building something. So that's about me. So what I had prepared for uh, this talk was uh, I had known that there had been some conversations already. So I'm just going to do a little bit of an overview of infrastructure as code. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the skills and the tools that I used. And that I think along pretty much everybody's journey in some form uh, or so of going down this path, you're going to come across. I, I, they're pretty common. Um, and it's about kind of defining your own route to adopting these skill sets. Um, and then I'll do a little talk around why is infrastructure, why infrastructure is code and what does it do around the operation side? Because it is a change in how we operate our infrastructure, whether it's just networks as well as this compute side or whether it's cloud and bringing it all together. There is a difference in how we have to work together as teams. And then I do have a small demo uh, that I'll talk through uh, as much as we need to, um, and uh, we'll go from there. 
So what is infrastructure as code? Um, there's a number of quotes out there. Uh, you can go to Amazon, Azure, GCP, pick an infrastructure as code tool set out there, and, and you'll pretty much find a very closely aligned ter uh, definition, which is really the defining and provisioning of our infrastructure. Um, and we define that in files as code or codifier infrastructure, right? Um, it could become as simple as defining the different components or the different sequences that configure our infrastructure in a text file. As that could be that simple. Um, but really what it brings is when we start to implement some of the uh, tools that we have, as well as the skills and, and just the operational benefits, we can now start to work better as teams and, and then actually help that to scale ourselves out. It doesn't need to replace the engineer. It needs to augment the engineer to make them more scalable and do the things that they enjoy doing. <clears throat> so you've probably seen something along these lines. Um, the traditional approach to infrastructure provisioning today, which is very common still to this day, is a project comes in, um, we got to make a change to some infrastructure. Uh, we might write down that code, so maybe we take a show run and we edit a, a, a switched virtual interface configuration and add an IP address or add a new one, for example, right? Then we log into switches and routers along the way, implement the change, maybe update routing information. Likely there's a firewall if we have security in place here. Um, we might have to update some rules. And then now in this world of hybrid cloud, there's a good chance that you might have to also provision some components of that, whether it be in the public cloud, as well as in your own private cloud, likely on some site of virtualized infrastructure or even bare metal server infrastructure. And all this gets us to our base application. And what that really looks like is if we look at it in my world of being uh, cloud networking TSA, I spent a lot of time in ACI, so I will talk a little bit about it. Um, but it's screens after screens after screens just to get to the application. It's a lot of touch points. And if a change has to be made, we back it all up and we do it again. So when we move it to an infrastructure as code approach, that's really where we define the different resources and how the infrastructure is going to look. We maintain state typically. Um, we also hear that term heard a lot now uh, where we define what it should look like and then we just make changes in the file and then it gets implemented within our infrastructure. This is, uh, we'll talk a bit more about this specific snippet of code, but this, if you're looking at it, is uh, a Terraform um, a HashiCorp configuration language that this is written in. Um, and this is really just defining a base ACI tenant that I actually use every day to build for demos uh, as part of some of the stuff I do. So some of the skills and tools. So uh, the way I took this, um, it's not completely linear uh, left to right, but it's pretty close. Um, uh, I was not a programmer. I, in technical school, I took C programming. Uh, I could not tell you how to do it today. I probably could recognize it, maybe. Um, but uh, I never used it outside of school. Uh, so I would not call myself a programmer in any sense. Uh, so approximately 10-ish years ago, I, took, uh, I, I started getting into this and started thinking I should learn a language. So I did, and I'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then along those pieces, I discovered and I started to see the use of cases for different tools, such as the source control tools that are available, understanding and learning different data formats, and then creating simple use cases that were actually beneficial to me and my customers as a consultant. <clears throat> and then from there, I took the last step, which this I've probably been at the infrastructure as code, I'll call it, stage with Tulin for about four years now. So really kind of leveraging each one built off each the other, um, but it really just gave a good foundation. I don't want anybody to come away from this talk saying that you have to become a programmer to leverage infrastructure as code tools. Uh, it would be good if you had a little bit of a, a overview of a different language just to understand what kind of is going on. But there is no requirement that you need to understand Golang or, or Python or C++, whatever language you want to pick out there. Um, it's just that this was the roadmap I took, and it seemed to kind of build upon itself and make it really easy so that when I got to the last step, it became really quick for me to adapt and start to use those tools. 
So as I said, I wasn't a programmer, so I had to pick something. Um, and this was when I first started, DevNet was kind of, you know, getting it, it was in its infancy. Um, and it, back then, I'm pretty sure DevNet only said Python. <laughs> um, but so it was really easy. There was a lot of content available. Um, and I learned a ton really quickly. Um, it's a relatively easy language to learn as it's easy to learn through for the most part. Um, and there are two simple use cases. Uh, I did leverage hey, a lot of what DevNet, hello. Yeah, um, you broke up a little bit. You may want to turn off your video. Oh. It, um, it's not consistent, but just, you know, just F FYI. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, so I picked the language Python um, and it's again, very easy. I, I found compared to others, uh, very readable. Um, and there was a lot of tools specifically in the networker space that it made it really easy to find resources on Google and YouTube to see how things were done. It's a lot, as well, there's a lot of training that was available for free or go to your favorite training sites uh, and you can find tons of content. There's other languages for sure. I'd say the other common one that you hear a lot about is Golang. Um, I have not touched it yet, um, but it might probably in the future might try to experience a little bit of that because there are some uh, tools that I think, um, well, one, they're built on, but two, uh, there's a lot more content coming available. And pretty much right after you pick up a programming language, like almost on the second page of the guide, it feels like, uh, they talk about source control and versioning of your code. So Git um, is the tool that is widely used. Um, and really what that does is it gives us the ability to source or version control our, our, our code and iterate upon it without having to do the, like everybody, I, and I know I did, um, show run, you store it into a text file, and then you called it version one, and then you made a change, you called it version two, and then you made another change, you called it 2A for whatever reason. <laughs> um, you can avoid that. Um, and we can use the, the capabilities and the tool and that Git brings so that we can just create a change, commit that change to the effectively to the history or the version control, and be able to go back and see what the difference is along those lines. One of the big benefits is now you're infrastructure that has been defined in configuration is code now ha is a living document. Um, and you can see every time I make a commit, uh, I, I can put a message in there and define, okay, this is why I made this change. And it, I can actually, there's a way to actually add additional details, but for this case, we can give an idea of, okay, this change was made on this date. Why was it done? Okay, moving forward. And we can see the history of the infrastructure. You'll see through this snapshot that I continuously do the same thing, add and remove uh, a web EPG. <clears throat> Sorry, the other piece to that is GitHub. So there's other um, version control systems out there um, for storing your repos or your repositories. GitHub, I'm sure everybody on this call has probably heard of it. Uh, it seems to be the most popular. Um, and so that's the one I chose because there was the most information, easiest to find, um, and uh, easy just to start picking up. So, uh, great tool. Uh, there's are there are others out there like Bitbucket and such, but uh, find the tool that fits yourself, your your use cases, and maybe within your own teams, maybe your team is using a specific tool, and that would drive some of the decisions that we did, that I bring up today too as well. So the third thing that comes pretty quickly is uh, data structured or structured data and understanding the different formats. XML has been around quite a long time. Uh, you've probably seen it somewhere. Um, um, and it's just really understanding, being able to identify it, uh, understand how the tag in and then where the data sits within the, the construct that becomes important. Um, the ones that you'll start to see most when we start talking about infrastructure as code, I'd say, uh, from what I've seen uh, is JSON and YAML, which are the bottom two. JSON's really nice um, to use, especially if you have a Python background. It looks like Py Python dictionaries. It's very readable um, and it becomes really easy to work with, especially with a programming language with Python. It's very easy to just take that as a JSON payload and push it into a directory. Um, the other one is YAML, which, you're, if you 
have played with Ansible. It's probably the most common place you'll see it. Um, but that's really how you define what we'll call playbooks in Ansible. Uh, and you define your infrastructure in this same similar model though. But if you look at all three, they all have very similar tree in or structure in, right? And this is very important because if you were to just do a show run on a router, let's say, and you built a Python script, for example, uh, and it SSHs into the box, you can go and get it to do a show run and pull that into a variable. And now you have what is very human readable that if you looked at a Cisco router would be the running configuration, but it's very difficult to um, iterate through it and parse it down. And usually what it means is regex. Uh, and if you're like me, um, you only use it if you need to. Um, it, it's, it, it has its place, um, but unfortunately when you're reading a human readable input or output, it's almost a necessity and it can get very complicated and complex very quickly. By using these data structures, we can be able to iterate through the different dictionaries and the different key values to pull out the value and then make our code do what we want it to do. So yeah, those were the three things that I started off with. Built this up, you know, played around with like some virtual routers or just doing print statements and just understand the language and how it works. Build my own little like mock JSON file and push it in and try to iterate and see how it works. The next step was getting some use cases. So as a consultant, I had a lot of opportunities <laughs> uh, to leverage some of these different skill sets that I'm sure for those of you that are consultants out there, or even if you're managing your own environments, um, you've probably come across a scenario where you're like, man, I got to log into like all these devices and literally type the same thing. So what did you do? You probably put it in notepad, you logged in, copy, paste, save, do the thing over and over and over. That's very repetitive, very error prone. You could miscopy by one character at the end and it would accept it and you'd never know and move on. Um, so I had really these two projects that kind of popped out when we were having this chat and setting up this conversation today was the one that was the best um, use case. I was brought in on a project. Uh, they were a new customer. Um, we had a history with the IT manager from previous uh, roles that he had had in other locations. So he brought us in um, and he had taken on this new environment and discovered that he really didn't have any idea what was out in his in all of his locations. So they were very small locations, but there was about 30 of them, if I remember correctly, across all of Canada. Um, and they knew that there was a firewall there. They had a VPN tunnel and they knew they had people there, but they had no idea what APs were out there, what switches, how many switches, this type of information. And, and really how old was this? What, where are they in the evergreen process? So they had contracted us to literally log in to every single site for four weeks and just get version information and a baseline, just check and see like his NTP set up, his TACX set up, you know, some of the basics, the, nothing complex and give them an idea of where stuff is and what does their network kind of look like. So I logged into one site and did this and it took about uh, about an hour to two hours just to collect all the information crawling through the network doing like show cdp uh, and see the different steps and try to piece this network together that's on the other side of the country and i thought after a day of this i go home and i'm like meh i'm going to see if i can write this and in, in leverage some of the python stuff that i had learned along the way so that's what i did i sat for about four-ish, five hours one night um, and pounded away, playing around, had one site that was close that I know I could make a call against. And I managed to build a script that uh, literally took a list of IPs. Had a, they had TACX, so it was good for centralized authentication. So I could then just out of band pass in the, the username and password and it would go out and connect to all the devices and just pull the information I need and then format it down to a very basic CSV file. What's the device? What model is it? What model number? Or uh, sorry, um, a software version it is, right? Um, and then I pulled some other statistics out of it and saved it into just vanilla files so that we could at least have a big view of the infrastructure. That script took four-ish hours to build, four to five hours to build, and took 10 to 12 minutes to run and documented all of the locations. 
So as a consultant, that would be very worrisome. I just took four weeks of work and turned it into effectively a day and a half uh, by the time it was all done. What that actually turned out to is it was provided value to the customer and they seen it and they said, okay, well now we have this, we already contracted. Let's go through and figure out an actual evergreen process because a lot of the infrastructure was old. And it actually turned into years of work. Um, contracted work that was very beneficial to both us, the, the partner, but also the customer and everybody like still to this day is uh, very close actually was at a hockey game the other week with them. So it was a very good experience and it was one of those safe ones. You know, I wasn't changing anything. I was just pulling stuff. The second one was a much smaller, um, but for those that might have a voice background or a collab background, I did deploy Cisco made in server. Um, that's like um, the video bridge in server uh, that Cisco acquired from Akana uh, about, I think it was about six, seven years ago. Um, very good server, it has a fully exposed API. So I had to build uh, effectively meeting spaces or personal meeting rooms, I guess you could call them, right? And, and to do that through the UI is like click, fill in six boxes, accept, do this again, uh, and when you have to do a number of them, over a hundred of them, uh, it gets te very te uh, tedious and, and again, very uh, uh, error prone. So they, it's very well documented for that API. It was very good. They had a good document you could just read in examples. So I just took it about a half an hour, maybe, I think maybe it was lunchtime one day, wrote a small little tiny script, gave it so that it popped up and gave you a CLI and said, hey, Tell me the how many um, what's where do you want to start and what's the range of the meeting room numbers and just it just went out and spit them out and created them all. Didn't save a ton of time, probably saved a couple hours long run. But what it did do is it now gave me that ability that I could take that script and just use it in other deployments that I had done in the, uh, after that. So two really good starter use cases. And this is really where I started to get the OK, if I can automate it, I'm doing it this way. I'm not going into every device. <clears throat> so infrastructure as code tools. So this is just a, a, a small snapshot of some of the common ones that I captured and that I've had either cross paths or read a little bit about. Um, I'm going to talk about two of them that I picked out of this, uh, but I did just want to call out. There are others out there um, and it's all about picking the tool for the task, not the specifically that tool might not complete the entire project or job, right? I think that's a misconception of a lot of uh, people that manage infrastructure. I have this conversation a lot with a, a buddy of mine. Oh, I just want one tool. Okay, that, that, that's an option. You could definitely make one of these tools, I'm sure, probably fit 99% of your use cases. And then the 1% or maybe it's less than whatever the percentage ratio is, you'll just do it the manual way. You, you could go down that path, right? And that is an option. But I think it's really important to understand that there are other tools out there. And if we think of like just our mechanics, right? Like the mechanic just doesn't have a wrench in a, in a toolbox and that's how he fixes your entire vehicle. He's got wrenches and he's got impacts and he's got different uh, pullers and uh, torque wrenches just so that he can do the job efficiently and get it out of, uh, properly. And it's all about matching the tool to the, the task not the entire job. So in this snapshot, just take a peek. Um, they're, they've been released at different phases. The first four at the top are, I'll call them, they're the, the earlier ones that came out for the most part. Um, they're all um, infrastructure is code agnostic. And what I meant by that was they're not really tied to a specific vendor. Um, they can, if you're in the cloud space, work on GCP, AWS, Azure, you name it, um, they might have modules or plugins for a number of on-premise uh, infrastructure uh, that you might have in your environment, whether it be the VMware and HPs of the world. Um, but the one uh, that I think is probably the most common in the network space that I've seen at least is Ansible at the top there. Uh, it's not agent-based. So what that means is there's no agent being deployed to the remote infrastructure to be managed. You just run it from a control machine uh, and then it effectively calls out to the infrastructure uh, based on the type of connection it requires, whether it be by the uh, API or SSH into it. 
Um, they're all four of those are open source, but they do have uh, op uh, optional enterprise offerings around them. Uh, Ansible has what's called Ansible Tower. Uh, that is a product from Red Hat. Um, and it really is, uh, it gives a number of capabilities, but I, I just simplify it to, it does give you a nice user interface that you can log into, provide role-based access, and just launch your playbooks from there. Makes it really easy as a team to work on. Um, so that is a paid product, um, and we won't be going in, into that at all, but just so that you're aware when you're Googling around on the internet, you'll see that. The other three, uh, AWS CloudFormation, Azure Re Resource Manager templates, and GCP Deployment Manager templates. Those are infrastructure as code effectively templates, but they are dedicated to their specific uh, vendor. So AWS CloudFormation isn't gonna work in Azure and it's probably not gonna work on your on-premise VMware environment. Um, and, and the same goes for the others. They're really structured around their own infrastructure so, and their own offerings. And then the last one is Terraform. This one's a little different uh, than some of the others in that um, it is again cloud agnostic or infrastructure is code as ag agnostic. Um, it's not technically agent based. Uh, it does run from a specific location to connect to the resources. Um, but I think this is one that's really more focused around the infrastructure provisioning. Whereas the others, especially Ansible and the Puppet, they're really more around the configuration management side of the house. Again, it's open source. Uh, so there is a Terraform CLI that is open source. You can download it uh, a number of ways for pretty much every operating system, um, but they do have enterprise offerings that are available from HashiCorp. What did I pick? Uh, you probably guessed I picked Ansible. Um, and, and the really reason why I picked Ansible was it was kind of shameless. Um, my company was working on a deal that was going to sell Ansible Tower to a customer and they needed somebody to take sales training. Uh, so I got free training and as a result of it, I got to learn Ansible. Um, and it was really good. Um, I like that it's a it's built on Python, so that made it easy for me to understand, you know, kind of some of the inner workings, kind of need to know that. Um, it uses YAML uh, to define what it's called its playbooks. Um, and it's pretty easy to get going. Um, you can get it running in uh, no matter of time at all. Um, but it's really focused around that configuration management, which I've started to use the association to, um, it's good at, doing like the process management. I wanna configure the application. It's really good at that stuff. Like deploy me a container and, and set up the container this way type stuff. It's really good at that type of stuff. The other one is Terraform. Uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, I started playing with this one. Uh, this one, like I said, is really focused on provisioning the infrastructure. How, what is the switch configuration, for example? What is my virtual machine look like? What are the specs of that virtual machine? Um, the firewall rules, define the, how that looks. That's really what it's good at. It does have some configuration tools and provisioning capabilities, um, but I'll be honest, what I use it for, when I use it, I spin up a VM um, I define how I want my VM, and then I actually pass Ansible playbooks into it and have it run scripts that actually execute Ansible on top of it. So the point here is there's two different tools. They both fill a need in the specific tasks that they need to do for the different use cases I have, um, and they can work together quite well. So the last thing I just wanted to round out here is there's a lot of code here. You're going to define your infrastructure. You're going to, you can do it in a regular notepad or in a text editor on your laptop, whatever it might be, whatever OS. Uh, but there are um, a number of editors out there. Um, Atom, Notepad++, Sublime, uh, PyCharm was one that's for Python. There's others out there um, as well. Uh, again, not exhaustive at all. Um, but these are some of the ones that I experienced with. Um, Adam was really cool. Um, if you took, depending on when you were taking some DevNet training, if you did any of the labs in the past, uh, you've probably seen PyCharm and Adam. So I got some easy access to play with both those. Didn't have to download them. Uh, I think they're both cool. They both have their benefits. Um, Notepad++, uh, I put it in there. Uh, it, is a, it is an editor. Um, and a lot of network engineers probably use this and already have it uninstalled there 
laptops. So there you go. You could use that one. Um, I'm a Mac user, so it didn't have a lot of value for me because I'd have to run a Windows VM, unfortunately. Um, but again, if that's the tool of choice, eh, that's that's great. Um, I ended up on Visual Studio Code. Um, it's a nice interface. It had all the nice plugins. It was pretty quick. Um, I, I like the look and feel of it. Um, really, the point here is, is there's a lot of options out there. Um, try some out um, and you'll likely land on the one that you prefer. Um, I would recommend um, if you are going down this path to have some experiment with some of them and then find that one that's going to deliver what you need. You're going to get things like Linton and syntax highlighting and the ability to like identify errors before you know you go and try to execute your code. Help you to make it look nice formatting is all the, like the right indentations and values that way and almost all of them offer additional plugins that will give you ability to like integrate git right into it so try them out try the one you like uh, and uh, i'm they're all fantastic tools that's enough about like skills and, and tools and stuff that i've went through uh, the next is around the shift in operations so if you think about it, um, the industry, it seems like, especially the networking industry, I feel like lately, has really been big on this discussion of infrastructure as code and the APIs. And like, this is not a new thing. Like, I think that's something that kind of gets lost in this. If you're a server admin uh, or an engineer that manages that, that, that domain of your, your, your install base, I would put almost put a bet on it that you probably use some sort of tool, whether it's PowerShell maybe for Windows admins, um, or they just use PowerShell for a number of other things nowadays, um, or you have maybe bash scripts and stuff to manage your infrastructure. This just really started to, it's being used in other areas, and now it seems to be showing up in the network space uh, over the last number of years. Also, uh, I know we were talking really briefly while we we're all hanging out, getting ready here, uh, a little bit about AWS and that. If you go look at these cloud operators, they give you a they give you a nice portal to go in there, and you can do everything. But if you take any bit of their training, I think it's like uh, you're going to find out very quickly that interface is there to check bill in and expose you to what's available, but really to pro uh, uh, put this into production and be able to scale, uh, they really drive their APIs, right? So being able to consume them as infrastructure as code is very critical to the scaling bit. So what does that change? So if we look at it from a network's perspective, uh, I have a, if we, we have a planned out week here, uh, Monday, uh, somebody submits a ticket, hey, it's the IT manager or director, it's that time, or security, whatever, logs that ticket, that's time to rotate some secrets. Let's pick SNMP here for today. Ticket gets picked up by me, and I go, okay, yeah, should be done by the end of the week. I can probably no, I don't get any spare time now. Um, so Monday, I've started to get this going. See, okay, I got to change these secrets. Tuesday's coming along, and Wednesday, uh, at the same time, Jane, she's a coworker of mine. She's taking on a new office space that's being deployed this week. Deploying a handful of switches and routers, maybe. Um, and here I am, I'm updating our configurations and starting to get the new secrets, right? And get everything ready to go, connecting out to my infrastructure and starting to provision this. Well, Jane has probably a CAN config maybe on her device, or maybe she pulled it off of another device and is just editing it um, from a site that I hadn't updated yet. So she's gonna put in the old secrets. She's gonna deploy her infrastructure, put it into production, Saturday morning comes and all of a sudden there's this error, there's this ticket log that the network's down when it's not really down, it's just SNMP can't see it, right? It's not a major issue, could be a lot bigger, but this just gets the point, right? When we start working in teams on our infrastructure and we start to make changes that are a little bit independent of each other, it makes it become very easy for things to get missed. So if we look at that same process, when we look at it as an approach from an infrastructure as code approach, for this scenario, um, again, I'm just going to store my code and my infrastructure has been defined. It's already running. Uh, my main, uh, my production environment is set and I've defined, it's uploaded it into um, source control. 
So our team manages it, all of the infrastructure and it's just stored in a GitHub repo for this example. And we do everything from the main branch. The main branch is everything that's in production. So same scenario, time to rotate secrets, pull it in. This time I'm going, hey, we're using automation, so I should be able to get this done by the end of the day. Um, and I'll do, go and do a branch of that main one. So I have a copy of the infrastructure and I'm gonna make the required change that I need to be. Likely, if I've do, done, done this this way, it's probably just one variable in one spot. I'll go and create that update and then I'll push it back into our GitHub and, and create what's called a pull request. This pull request is really good. It now gives us ability to collaborate as a team. Maybe as part of that pull request, um, it comes out and it does some additional tests, maybe on a just check it for syntax, or you could do run it against a test lab environment potentially. We can also discuss it as part of our change control meetings. And then once the uh, pull request is reviewed and approved, it's merged back into main. Once it gets merged into main, our automation is monitoring the main branch, sees the change has happened, and now it executes and it configures my infrastructure. Now this is a small change, so it probably did only take like before lunch to do this. Jane, two days later, is working on her switch program, uh, process. She does the same steps. She's gonna now merge, or sorry, branch um, the from the main uh, into the new branch, new site branch. She'll make her changes. So in this scenario, she's probably going to upload. She's going to upload the details about this infrastructure. It's going to need site names and uh, host names and uh, what's the subnets are going to be out there, right? And she's going to define the infrastructure as far as filling out this template for the most part. She's likely going to have to give the bare minimum configuration on the switches so they can actually come up on the network. But once it's connected to the network, the rest of the configurations will be set, right? So we'll we'll review this. We'll go through that same process and merge into main. Execution automation will execute, reach out to the new sites that have been brought online, and start to provision. This gives us the ability to now define uh, uh, consistency within the environment, and now the documentation is taken care of. We have living documentation of our entire environment uh, and as well as a history of every change that is done within this infrastructure. <clears throat> so I hope that kind of gave a little bit of an idea kind of how I got there. Uh, I do have a demo. Uh, we'll walk through it. Um, we'll go through the code a little bit. Um, Hopefully it doesn't get, if it's too much on the Terraform side, just someone pipe up, we can definitely jump forward. But hopefully uh, it kind of gets some of this case, uh, makes a case for this scenario. So what's going to happen is I've actually already defined my infrastructure and I actually have it run in. Uh, the reason for that is I do spin up a couple of VMs and they take about 15 minutes to go through the whole boot up process and initial provisioning. So to not sit there and you know stare at the ceiling, uh, I've got that done ahead of time. But so what I've done is I've defined all my code. Uh, all that infrastructure was pushed into GitHub. I've integrated it with Terraform Cloud for Business in this case. So this is a paid service, um, but I'm only using this uh, just because uh, I wanna show some of the triggers um, and I didn't wanna have to deploy each piece manually on premise. I've also integrated this with our team collaboration tool, WebEx, uh, so that I get messages as things are being happening to my repo. So as a team, we could see I'm making a change. Oh, I need to go take a look at his pull request. What is he doing, right? Um, it just makes it, gives us another uh, avenue to notify, notify the team. Once the, 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 the requests are approved, we'll see that Terraform is gonna then kick off and run this against our infrastructure. The reason why the Cisco Intersight is on there is uh, we don't use anything with it uh, for this, um, but what we are using is a service that we have that allows us to deploy the Terraform agent uh, inside of our environment. And so I said Terraform doesn't have an agent. Terraform has like an agent that helps us do like proxy, I guess you could say. So it runs on premise so that you don't have to expose all your on-site hardware to the internet. Uh, otherwise, the cloud wouldn't be able to reach it. Uh, if you're just doing this from your laptop, then you don't need any of this. You just VPN in and you're off to the races. 
So what we're going to see is for those of you that are not aware of what ACI is, uh, it's just the SDN solution for the data center that we have from Cisco. Um, and it is a whitelist model. So I'm going to have two endpoints, a web endpoint and a, an app endpoint that are to communicate so that I can deliver my application. Uh, but they're in different endpoint groups. And so there's no contract in between, so they can't talk to each other. So we're going to fix that and we're going to implement the policy to allow them to communicate. All right, so here's my application that's not working um, right now. It's broken, so this is what we're going to fix. <clears throat> so just to kind of recap where things are. So again, I've stored my infrastructure is stored uh, for this specific application. So I've defined all the components that make up this application. The endpoint groups um, and the policies are defined in this GitHub repo. Um, and I've split them into two different folders. Uh, and this is so that I can separate the application components, so the VMs, from the network. Uh, and I'll show how those are broken up when I talk, go to Terraform. But if we take a look at them, I'll just take a look at the application space. You'll notice I have Ansible. So I actually have Ansible scripts in here that actually deploy the, AG, the app, the Docker app, and the Nginx uh, reverse proxy that I'm going to configure. <clears throat> And this is what Terraform looks like. So really, I've defined stuff as a module, and I just pass in, what do I want these VMs to look like? And how do, where's my uh, Ansible playbook that I need to call so that I can build it the way I need it? <clears throat> and then if we look at our network, uh, it's going to look similar. Uh, we'll look at this in the editor. Um, but again, this is all the, the code that makes up our infrastructure. This could really be put into like two files. Uh, I've just broken it up to make it easier to read. The modularity component of programmability, I guess you could say. We'll take a quick look at the workspaces in uh, Terraform Cloud. So I've defined these workspaces. Uh, for those that don't know about Terraform, just consider these different folders or repos or different segments. Um, and the reason why I've broken them up like this, so I have my network prod. This defines like my production network as far as the baseline. So I was telling a colleague earlier, I'm really just breaking it up so I can control the blast radius. <laughs> when I'm making a change, I want it to affect only the parts that affect my application. I don't want it to affect the entire network. Terraform has this concept of apply and destroy. Apply, obviously applies the configuration, destroy, destroy everything. I don't want somebody to accidentally destroy their network, networking for their application and blow away the rest of my production tenant. Uh, I want to keep that separated, right? I still define it as code, but I maybe put some guardrails around it. Uh, and then the other two uh, are my application for my voting app and the network. And you'll see here, they're attached to the same repo. Um, and I just put the application on the end so I know that they're targeting different folders. <clears throat> These are all tied into that GitHub repo. I, I've attached them there. So anytime uh, GitHub, there's a change in the main um, branch, uh, there's a webhook that comes from GitHub to Terraform that kicks off the rest of the jobs. So the network. So this is generally, you would set this up they begin in, you know, you're setting up your infrastructure, you define how does it look, give me the box, there's different boxes that build up my infrastructure, the different components, um, and then you would heavily use leverage variables where possible. And this is really what this is. This is just saying I'm going to use the ACI plugin to talk to my infrastructure. Uh, here's some variables effectively. Um, and then if you see these data types, these are like gets. So I'm going to go get some information about my tenant ID, get some information about some existing bridge domains, which are like switched virtual interfaces or interface VLAN, um, get some information about my VMM domain. Um, this is just an integration piece that ACI does to VMware, so I can automate the configuration of the port group on the virtual switch. Um, and then really the meat of this is hey, my application, I just define what my application looks like. So it's a, it's a combination of an app profile, which is like a folder. Um, and a couple EPGs, a number of them, it could be a bunch. Um, so I create one resource that's going to go out and create a number of them based on the number of EPGs I pass to it. And then associate it to the different components that bring this stuff together. We're going to tie it to our VMM so we can extend it into 
uh, VMware. Um, and then we're going to handle some contracts. So in ACI, contracts are like, you, effectively, you have to think of it as your ACLs on your switches, right? So what makes up that? So there's the like ACL name <laughs> or contract name. Uh, we have this concept of subjects, which ties uh, filters in. So that's what our, our entries effectively. So if you think of it as your ACE entries, so what ports are we looking for that are interesting to this and then define is it a permit or deny effectively, right? So we got to build all this. And if we look at the code, I've just moved over here just because it's a couple steps and I don't want to do that every time and I make it easier to read. So we pass it to what's called a module, and then I can export that and then use that to make my associations. The last thing ACI does is it has this consume provider model around contracts, uh, source destination, just think of it that way, uh, EPG source, EPG destination, uh, and define the rules and that's it. So this is how like uh, the engineer would come in and define how the infrastructure is going to look. But this is not necessarily how operations would work with this. They, they may, um, but generally they'll work with it in an abstracted model as far as variables. <laughs> so if you look here, I've really defined two top level uh, variables. I have my EPGs and I have my contracts. And inside there, I have effectively a dictionary. Um, they call it a map uh, in Terraform, but it's a dictionary of key value pairs that define the pieces that make these EPGs. So I have my web EPG and my app EPG. They're both assigned with the same VMM domain. They could be different. Um, which bridge domain, so which effectively which subnet are they tied to? Uh, in this case, I've tied them to the same one for simplicity. Uh, could be different. Um, and again, different EPGs don't talk to each other unless uh, there's rules that are defined. And this is the part that's really important is these consume and provide contracts. So I defined a, a key for each of these types um, and th then the resulting uh, value is a list of different entries. So I've already defined the permit ICMP. So if I actually look at my servers, they're over on this screen here, they're incrementing in a way and they can ping back and forth, but nothing else is functioning uh, as you could see by when I refresh the web page. So the next thing is I said, I, I only need EPGs and I need contracts. So the next thing to manage this application is I need to define the different app contracts. So I've already defined, provisioned this contract in there uh, as far as pushing this code earlier. Um, and I really want to enable port 5000 to be communicated between the web EPG and the app EPG. Uh, that's the port that the app is listening on for um, HTTP. So this so no spelling mistakes so my app epg is going to provide a service on port 5000 and my web epg oh i just totally let's back that up for a second because we totally didn't listen to what i was supposed to do okay so we're going to make changes to this infrastructure um and the big thing here is the get piece right so i've uh, I've done this. It's uh, connected to Git, as we've seen earlier, to a Git status. Uh, I'm on the main branch. My origin is the main, um, and I'm actually connected to a remote source uh, for that. So I'm going to be doing this change. So the rules in this scenario is we don't do changes against main. So I've actually put in provisions so I couldn't commit this change uh, against the main branch. So the first step is we we get a new branch and we move into it. So we're going to check out branch and we'll call it demo. Right. That's cool. So by doing that, I created a new branch called demo night um, and I've just switched it in. Um, my screen here covers this up, but you can even see in my editor here. I, it actually switched down here to demo night as well. So one of the nice things about using an editor um, that integrates with GitHub, like almost most of them do, uh, you can get some visual cues as well. So that's all we do. We create it. Um, you could do this through a workflow inside the application. Uh, I just prefer the CLI myself. <clears throat> so let's go and make that change. So our change was to provide and consume this contract that allows port 5000. So I'll save my changes. I'm now going to add them back into um, the tracking so that it can add those changes into uh, the next commit. 
effectively stage in my commits. I'm then going to commit this. So this is all done locally. If I go look on GitHub right now, demo night branch does not exist. It's, it does not. It doesn't show up anywhere in there. But I'm going to commit this to the local Git uh, uh, repository on my laptop. And I'm going to do a commit. Dash M is just a message, so I can do inline. Um, and I'm going to say enable HTTP forward 5000. Good enough. Now the next step is I need to now push this back into the main remote repository. We're not pushing it to main. We're just getting it up there so that now it's available uh, uh, on GitHub and our team can start to collaborate on it. So I'm going to do a git push because um, demo night doesn't exist. I got to effectively tell it that to create it and push this uh, these changes into that branch. So I'll push it up there. And when we do that, um, because of the remote being GitHub, it pops back and says, create a pull request for demo night by visiting this link. So you could click it and go right away. And we can see that a new branch was created called demo night. One of the other things that's happening is I mentioned earlier that um, I had uh, WebEx integrated. So I added the bot. So this just came in at 8.57 my time, so about 30 seconds ago. Um, it says who did this. So I did this. It's my username Pat, against my GitHub repository or this repository. Here's the commit ID. Um, and here's the message. So again, now my team, if we're all listening to this, we can see, OK, something's going on. Maybe we need to check it out. Just going to make this window a little smaller for a second so we can just see it in the side. So I'm going to go back to GitHub now and just refresh the page here. I can see that my demo branch uh, has appeared here. Um, and I'm just going to make a pull request. So there is a pull request that pops up. It says, hey, someone pushed into here. There's available for doing a pull request. So I'm just going to click the button because it's simple. Um, and I can now give a little bit of comment. Okay, I want to make this change. I want to get this change pushed into production. But I'm going to give it a little more detail. So uh, in order so uh, to connect web EPG to app EPG, let's say. So now we're given details. Our team knows what's going on. We're going to create that pull request. In a second, we should see this pop up. So we integrated with uh, Terraform Cloud for Business here. Uh, and one of the reasons I did that was specifically to show kind of the use cases that gets um, like a, in a CI CD pipeline, continuous integration and de deployment. So as part of that, there's checks and balances that are being placed in here. Not only does a human go in there and have the ability to go read and see the different commits and the changes, but because of the way that Terraform is actually integrated here, um, and this is purely from a webhook perspective, it's going to run what's called a Terraform plan. And it's just going to tell me what's going on. Does this code even fit like all the syntax? Is, it, is there something broken in it? Is there a resource that's not defined or something, right? There were some other broader changes. So this will take a, about a minute to run. Um, and then once it's done, we should get the green check mark. And we can see some details about what's going to happen. Wait for that. I'll just pop over and actually look at what Terraform Cloud's doing. Just finished. So what we can see is we click that details, and I just pulled over here, and it's just going to tell me what's happening. It's still it's taking all the information I had from GitHub. I can see it, this was triggered by GitHub by me effectively on the demo night branch. Um, it's for this specific pull request. If I expand it, I can see some more details about it. And the way Terraform works, it, it just does this state verification. It shows, OK, when we make this change, this is what's going to change. Nothing has happened to production. But we can see that some consume contracts and provide contracts are going to change. It also calls out that this won't be pushed into production because it cannot be applied. Again, if I go back to my web app, it's still broken.
So back at GitHub, all of our checks have passed. So you could have a lot of checks. You could have, hey, make sure that there's a readme and make sure there's all these other details that are been pulled in. So you can really start to build your pipeline the way you like to make it for your team. So everything's good here. Uh, I feel comfortable that we're gonna get the change that we need. Um, it's during our change window, so I'm gonna let it go. Um, I'm gonna merge this pull request uh, as the, not necessarily the author, maybe it's Jane logged in and she's doing the change. And I'm just gonna give her the thumbs, give myself the thumbs up and I'm gonna confirm that merge. And now what's happened is it's merged my demo night back into master. What's also happening is now Terraform, if I go back to my network, you can actually see it's already start stuff here. It's doing another run and it's going based on that merge request. But this time, uh, if we click on it, span this up, you'll see that the new branch is main. And we're tracking this. This is production now, right? Uh, and you can see my uh, teams over here is updating and showing me that things are happening. The reason why this was triggered was there was a detected change in the directory. Um, and I can see the comments. There's my thumbs up. Again, the plan went through and it's checking to see what it's going to do. In this case, it says same thing that we've seen earlier. But I've configured this workspace to automatically implement these changes. There's nobody that has to come in and click the, yeah, you're still good to go. Uh, that's an option, but uh, just to make things some streamlined, I uh, uh, automated that piece. While this runs, uh, I'm just going to, because it does take about a minute. Uh, one of the things that you'll see also is it says there's another run that's triggered in the queue here. And that's for my application. So once this apply is completed, it's actually going to go and create, create another plan. It's going to go run this check inside of my application. Um, uh, workspace. It's not going to do anything into production, um, but it's just going to see and tell me what's going to change. I know nothing's going to change, but the use case here would be maybe you had a firewall uh, as the second piece of this infrastructure and you wanted to tie them together and you're just adding a new subnet. And when you add a new subnet, you got to add a new rule inside the firewall. Maybe So you could trigger that so that they could work off of each other, for example. And if we click on here and we just go and take a quick peek at what that looks like, it's probably ran already. I'd still run it, oh, but it's already completed that no changes are required. So we can see that nothing's gonna happen, but if there was, we could come in here and we could click, there would be an apply button and we could commit those changes. The last thing we need to do, check that our application comes up and now we can vote for dogs all day long. So that's a very simple, uh, it tied a lot of pieces together, um, but it really, um, it kind of, I think, shows the capabilities of where when you start to use infrastructure as code and you start to use especially version control and you now have a history of everything that goes on. We have this ability to communicate and work as a team across our different commits. I can look at my code and see what has changed over the different, like I have a lot of commits in here, mainly because I take it in and out and I can see all the changes that have happened I made a, here we go, we're gonna take a look. We can see what difference happened. This was yesterday, uh, I was changing some stuff with ICMP. And so I had removed the permit ICMP um, off the provide and consume contracts for both of my EPGs. So now my live-in document of my infrastructure is completely documented and I can continually understand what's going on in my infrastructure. And with that, I think that covers everything. There you go. Russell, thank you. A um, couple of comments and dialogue as, as you were talking, some funny ones as well. So clearly people are voting for dogs. <laughs> but um, That's right. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can also open it up. So, you know, we're, we're, um, we can, you can unmute yourself if you have a question for Russell and ask away. Or if not, we're, we're good as well. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Russell, this is Jason. I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to do this tonight. This was actually a really great demo, I felt. Well, I appreciate it. 
I'll be honest, I was freaking out. <laughs> like I said at the beginning, <laughs> I've never done a talk quite like this. You're my first user group. <laughs> so you did great. You did great. Yeah. I told him I told him he'd be great. And and, <laughs> and and Russell, hopefully not the last, right? Yeah, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, I'm gonna be down in Southern California in March. That's right. <laughs> it will still be virtual, unfortunately, but uh, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. um Okay, so okay, so I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, and then see.